Welcome to Learn Electrics and our video on TT systems. We all know that TT systems need special consideration. Not least the fact that during an earth fault the fuse is unlikely to blow or at best it might operate very slowly outside the required response times. First we will briefly remind ourselves what a TT system is. Then we will look at the importance of RCDs in TT systems and also at the weaknesses of this type of system. And finally, we will cover the subject of ZE and ZS in TT systems. So, what is a TT system? We show here a simple schematic of a TT system. A fairly standard looking consumer unit and in this case with a couple of internal RCDs. Everything looks fairly standard, except that the earth path between the consumer unit and the supply transformer is not a copper cable. Any earth fault current relies on finding a path back to the transformer through the soil in which the earth rod is buried. We can compare here a TT system and a TN system. The TT system uses the soil as an earth path, as shown in the red box. The much more popular TN system has continuous copper conductors for phase, neutral and earth between the consumer unit and the supply transformer as shown in the orange box. So what is the problem with the TT arrangement? It's very easy. Because earth fault current flows through the soil there is a high resistance. A high resistance results in a low current and a low current will not trip the breaker and the circuit will not disconnect. You can see from the calculation that if the soil resistance was 100 ohms then only 2.3 amps of earth fault current will flow and this is clearly not enough to cause even a 6 amp breaker on a lighting circuit to trip. If you have an earth fault on your 32 amp socket circuit whilst you are holding the kettle then you have a big problem. The breaker will not disconnect. One solution, as we all know, is to install RCDs and we will look at this. Let's talk about metal consumer units and metal electrical cabinets. Older TT systems often used a front end RCD. In other words, even if RCDs were fitted inside the consumer unit, a separate RCD was installed just before the consumer unit. This would often be a 100 milliamp delay type or S type RCD to allow for discrimination between devices. But why 100 milliamps? Would another value ever be used? We have a table for this and the full version of this table can be found in the wiring regulations book on page 156. If we know the earth fault impedance in ohms we can quickly determine the tripping current required. We use a touch voltage of 50 volts since below 50 volts a normal healthy adult is unlikely to receive a fatal electric shock. A properly selected RCD should trip before the voltage on exposed metal work rises above 50 volts during a fault. 50 volts divided by 100 ohms will give a tripping value of 500 milliamps. And 50 volts divided by a soaring pins of 500 ohms will give a tripping value of 100 milliamps. That made selection easy. Partway through the 17th edition of the wiring regs and now into the 18th edition we have been required to install metal consumer units in all our new or upgraded installations that include a consumer unit change. And regulation 421.1.201 on page 80 tells us that in domestic premises consumer units and switch gear assemblies shall comply with BSEN 61439-3 and they must have their enclosures manufactured from non-combustible material or they must be in an enclosure of non-combustible material. And it is accepted that non-combustible means steel or similar metals. Regulation 132.12 on page 21 states Electrical equipment, in our case the consumer unit, must be accessible for operation, inspection and maintenance and so on. Plus, Part M of the building regulations also applies. Put these two together 
and this means that the consumer unit cannot be placed out of reach. It is therefore exposed to touch if anything goes wrong. But what could go wrong? Imagine now our metal consumer unit with no RCDs installed. We are relying on the MCBs or fuses alone for protection. An earth fault develops and the fault current flows along the earth conductor, but, as we have just calculated, only 2.3 amps flows because of the high soil resistance. All exposed metalwork that has a connection to the earth bar will become energised at 230 volts until the fuse blows or the breaker trips. But it won't trip, because at best it's a 6 amp breaker, or at worst perhaps a 32 amp device. All the property will be energised during this fault, and the circuit remains live. Touch the metalwork, and it's going to hurt. Let's now install our front end RCD placed before the consumer unit. Now, when we have an earth fault on one of the circuits leaving the consumer unit, the breakers still won't trip, but the RCD will operate because it detects a difference in phase and neutral currents, which both have a copper conductor all the way back to the supply transformer. Now, everything at the front end RCD is disconnected by the RCD and the installation is made safe. Should the fault be before the RCD, there is nothing to protect the installation and there is the possibility that any exposed metalwork can become live. And with a high impedance earth path, the main cutout fuse is unlikely to operate in the required 5 seconds. It could actually be several minutes. But now we seem to have taken a step backwards and we rarely fit a front end RCD, preferring to rely on just the internal RCDs or RCBOs in the consumer unit. As you can see from the orange box, the so-called danger area has increased, not decreased. But there are certain industry accepted customs and practices that, if we adhere to them and follow the guidance, they will help to ensure that problems and electric shock risk will be reduced to a minimum. Conductors on the supply side of the consumer unit must be double insulated. In other words, we are making them class 2 and giving them two layers of protection. You can see from the picture that the copper conductor is surrounded by first a layer of plastic insulation and then this is encased in a second layer of plastic sheathing. This is exactly the arrangement that we have with meter tails. Also, only manufacturer's approved links should be used inside the consumer unit. The manufacturer has designed the internal links to satisfy the requirements for safety for their consumer unit, so use them. Copper bus bars that are supplied by the manufacturer and are protected by a plastic guard are also acceptable. And using a torque wrench to secure the screws to the manufacturer's recommendations is also a requirement. The main tails and main earth conductors that enter the consumer unit must not enter through separate holes in the cabinet. Using separate holes will cause eddy currents that may cause a temperature rise in the cables. All three conductors must enter through the same hole. This is usually achieved by the use of a plastic squash gland with an insulating rubber bush or grommet to protect the cables. This same rule applies to all the other circuit cables. The phase, neutral and earth for each circuit must pass through the same hole in metal consumer units. If we summarise what we must do when installing a TT consumer unit, we see that a metal consumer unit or cabinet must be installed in new domestic installations. A front end RCD is not required. All circuits leaving the consumer unit must be RCD protected. And all cabling from the DNO's meter, that is the supply meter, all the way through to the main switch and onto the RCDs must be double insulated or reinforced insulation making it class 2. Adequate and reliable support such as cable clips, plastic trunking etc must be given to all cables from the supply meter to the consumer unit. This will be the weak point in the system and must be given the attention that it deserves. Top surface holes in consumer units or cabinets must meet IPXXD or IP4X, in other words maximum 1mm holes, and all other holes in consumer units must meet IPXXB or IP2X, 
which is a 12.5 mm gap. Fire stopping or sealing of penetrations around the consumer unit must meet building regulations requirements and all internal connections must be made with the consumer unit manufacturer's approved internal links. Bus bars are also allowed but they must be covered with insulating material. Ideally the consumer unit should be installed as close as possible to the service head to reduce the length of cables and the potential for mechanical damage. Now let us look briefly at ZE and ZS. Measure ZE as you would for a prospective earth fault current test for TN systems. This will also give you the ZE value. Because ZE is going to be high, ZS and ZE will be almost the same value. With 30 milliamp RCDs, the permitted maximum for ZS is 1,667 ohms. But for stability of readings, the ideal ZS should be below 200 ohms. Readings may differ between seasons, between wet seasons and dry seasons. We know that ZS will fail even before we test it. Why? Because a high ZE will make the ZS high. On the schedule of test results, what should we enter in the columns? We can enter the maximum permitted ZS as 1667 ohms for a 30 milliamp RCD and we can record the actual measured ZS in the results column. But how can we determine if the internal wiring is to the correct standards? After all, a high ZE could easily mask internal problems, since R1 plus R2 values will be different for every final circuit depending on cable lengths and cable sizes. How do we know if we have a good R1 plus R2? This is what I do. Measure R1 plus R2 as a dead test and then look up the maximum ZS for that circuit breaker in the on-site guide and deduct 0 0.35 ohms from this value. Why 0 0.35 ohms? That's because that number is the maximum ZE for a TNCS system and that's the only thing we have right now as a reference for a normal ZE. If, after doing this calculation of ZS minus 0 0.35, if your own actual measured R1 plus R2 is less than this number, then you can assume that your internal wiring is OK. Why bother, we ask? We bother because you want to know that your internal wiring would meet the permitted values. Just because it is a TT system doesn't mean that R1 plus R2 doesn't matter. It matters very much for short circuit protection, for overload and for voltage drop. So don't ignore it. Get it right be professional. As an example I've included this little chart to show you how using TNCS ZE data can help you to prove that your TT systems R1 plus R2 is within sensible parameters. Look at this chart now. For a 10 amp type B breaker the on-site guide gives a ZS maximum of 3.5 ohms. We know that ZS minus ZE will give us the R1 plus R2 value. So 3.5 maximum for ZS minus 0 0.35 allowance for ZE gives 3.15 ohms for R1 plus R2. If our R1 plus R2 for the 10 amp circuit is less than 3.15 ohms, we have a good result. A 16 amp breaker will have a suggested value of 1.85 ohms. And if our 32 amp circuit is less than 0 0.75 ohms for R1 plus R2, we can say that that is good too. It's easy, it's quick, and it helps you to feel confident that your circuit is as good as it can be. We hope that you found this video from Learn Electrics both useful and enjoyable. Please click on subscribe below and you will have access to all of our Tech Tips videos and we do appreciate that small act. Typing in Learn Electrics, all one word, into the YouTube search bar will also give you access to all the videos. Thank you for watching and we hope to see you again very soon.